morning. morning. Good to see everybody. Um, the Prince George's County Planning Board is now in session. From 10 to 11, we will be doing more administrative um, items and presentations. Um, so I, um, but I do want to make sure that we, uh, that everyone sees we have a quorum present. So I'm just going to call the roll. Uh, Madam Vice Chair. Madam Vice Chair. Okay, present. present. Um, Commissioner Washington. Present. Commissioner Dorner. I'm here. And Commissioner Geraldo. Present and accounted. Okay, wonderful. And I see we're joined by our counsel, our um, uh, senior counsel, Peter Goldsmith. And I'll do more introductions when we get to the um, other portions of our um, agenda for today. So um, I'm going to start off with item one. We have three resolutions, and um, I will elaborate a little more later, but we have three resolutions, uh, commissioner's resolutions for approval. Is there a motion? Move approval, Madam oh. Chair. Second. We have a motion from um, Commissioner Washington, seconded by Vice Chair Bailey. Um, Madam Vice Chair? Aye. Commissioner Washington? Aye. Um, Commissioner Dorner? Good aye. Commissioner Geraldo? I vote aye. Okay, the ayes have it 5 0. Thank you. Um, the next thing is we have the draft minutes from the meeting of November 12, 2020. Is there a motion? Move approval, Madam Chair. Um, we second. Ha we have a motion, Vice Chair Bailey, seconded by Commissioner Washington. Vice Chair Bailey? Good aye. Commissioner Washington? Aye. Commissioner Dorner? Good aye. Um, Commissioner Geraldo? Aye. The ayes have it 5 0. Um, the rest of our administrative items are items 3B, 3C, 3D, and 3E. The next one is 3B, which is a, a closed session. So, pursuant to um, Section 3-305B7 and B8 of the General Provisions Article of the Annotated Code of Maryland. Uh, we need a motion to uh, go into closed session for purposes of consultation with counsel and to consult with staff about potential litigation. So You know what? Um, okay. Vice, Chair, Vice Chair Bailey always beats you to it, so we're going to take Commissioner Geraldo's motion this time. Uh, so he's the motion maker. Vice Chair Bailey just <laughs> seconded it. Um, Vice Chair Bailey? Good aye. Uh, Commissioner Washington? Aye. Commissioner Geraldo? I vote aye. Commissioner Dorner? Aye. Okay, the ayes have it. Um, we will go, now go into closed session. You, you have a number, and um, we will come back and resume afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. I'll move, Madam Chair. Move. Okay, so we're going to take yours as a second, Commissioner Geraldo, and a motion by um, a motion by <laughs> Commissioner Washington. Um, uh, uh, Madam Vice Chair. I was the Hey, you're from Jersey now. Uh, <laughs> Commissioner Washington. Aye. Um, Madam Vice Chair. You're muted. Uh oh. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Dorner. Aye. Commissioner Geraldo. Aye. Okay. So we have several items remaining in in the 15 minutes that we have left. So um, I I just talked with our, our planning director and we're going to move items 3E and that would be um Miss um Scott Rowe and um. Um, Ms. Benton and Mr. Colomese, we're going to move that to the end of today. I'm sorry, but we want to hear you and want to give you your time. So now we have 15 minutes left and we have two more items, which will be items 3C, um, Black Branch Stream Valley Park, um, succinctly, and then we have our Park Police Mid-Year Update, succinctly. Thank you. So item 3B. Okay. Um, Mr. Tyler or Mr. Sun, who's presenting for this? 
Uh, I am Matt, Madam Chair. And I am would be. Also, I'm okay. Madam thank Chair. you, Mr. Sun. Let's go for it. Okay. Very succinctly. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, fellow, fellow Planning Board members. We are here today to request approval of, of the granting of a proposed golf cart, amended golf cart easement at Oak Creek Golf Course. Next slide, please. The area that we wish to focus is on Church Road, approximately one mile south of the intersection of Central Avenue. When the Oak Creek development was designed, a portion of the Stream Valley was dedicated to the commission to what is known as Black Branch Stream Valley Park. Next slide, please. As you may know, Oak Creek is a premier gated golf course community within Prince George's County. Just to provide you a brief description of the current conditions, Next slide. Um, next slide, please. There is an on-grade golf cart crossing across Church Road, which is less than ideal condition. This is part of the original design, and there was a golf cart easement, which is highlighted here in orange, that runs through our commission property for the 18-hole golf course. I also want to point out there is a multi-use trail on the other side of the in the Stream Valley Park that was built by the developer that goes through the Oak Creek community. As we as we go towards the final build out of the development, next slide please. The developers proposed a solution to solve this problem by taking the golf cart underground, which is highlighted here in yellow underneath church road along the black branch stream thus need thus creating a need for the additional golf cart easement which is highlighted here in red in return for doing that the developer has agreed to extend the hiker biker trail with a five foot sidewalk on church road five foot bike path an enhanced pedestrian crosswalk which allows safe access to crossing a church road Next slide. Here's a picture of how the tunnel underneath Church Road will look, creating a much safer environment. Next slide. In summary, the developer has submitted an executed revised easement document with the commission's signature for 8,530 square foot permanent easement to allow for the underground tunnel. In return, we will be working with the developer on an amended RFA to ensure the new pedestrian crossing will be constructed in conjunction with the new golf park crossing. Hey, Mr. Sun, um, we have yep. this in front of us now, and we see it's, uh, it's a good presentation, and I'm sure we and we have at least one regular golfer on, on the board. Um, and I see that you're and recommending. She enthusiastically moves approval, Madam Chair. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, we so have, I, I, this, this concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Recommend. We have a motion already, Mr. Sun. So we have your recommendation you. of approval. Thank you. Yeah. And, and and the motion by Commissioner Washington, second by Mad Vice Chair Bailey. Um, Madam Vice Chair. But I thank you for the presentation. Okay, Commissioner Washington. I vote aye. Commissioner, thank you for the uh, crossing okay. under the uh, church road. Commissioner Geraldo. <laughs> You're muted. Commissioner. That, that was so I wouldn't have to comment. Okay. Would I? Okay, thank you. Commissioner but, Commissioner Dwarner. Aye. Uh, okay. I'm I'm sorry, Mr. Sun. Everything's taking longer and we only have like coming up on twelve minutes for our police presentation. So that um that's thank go. you. Thank you, Mr. Sun. Okay. Um next we have before us item three um, D, which is our park police mid year update. Chief Johnson, okay, are you afternoon. presenting? Okay, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Of course, to uh, Chair Hewitt, Vice Chair Bailey, and the other commissioners, Dorner, Gerald, and Washington. Thanks for the opportunity just to share information with you with our Park Police uh, update. It's actually going to be a nearly year update. I'm providing information through um, 
through October 31st of this year. And just quickly, I have a lot of slides here. You guys have the presentation. Yes. But if we can go to slide 10. Okay, slide 10 uh, depicts our total calls for service for this year. We had a slight increase from last year, and of course, you can see the trend going upwards of 104,716 calls for service. Uh, and then if we can go to slide number 14, these are our part one crimes, our most serious crimes that might occur in the park uh, or uh, as a whole. So you see homicides, rapes, robberies, assaults, burglaries, larcenies, motor vehicle deaths. And what you'll see is our trend from 2013 to the present, uh, a pretty much a downward trend. There was upward trend slightly in 2019. And then on slide 15, you'll see the total numbers uh, for our part one crimes. Uh, it went from 339 in 2013 to 323 in 2014, 265 in 2015, uh, 217 in 2016, 212 in 2017, 200 in 2018, and upwards of about 15% increase in 2019. And of course, this year, an extremely low uh, trend for crimes, 124 through October 31st of this year. And the next few slides, you can go through them quickly if you don't mind. 16, 17, 18, and 19 show you, and 20 uh, show you on a pie graph uh, the, the crimes that we have in our park system. And obviously, thefts are most of the crimes that we do have uh, within our park system, anywhere from 65 to about 48% of our crimes are thefts. Uh, page 21. Uh, our crime trends, and I'm kind of written out where we are with our crime trends. Uh, reported UCR crimes on a downward trend. Reductions in deaths have contributed substantially to our decline. Uh, we've had a record low for part one crimes for 2015, 16, 17, and 18, and it appears we'll have another record low for the year 2020 if our trend continues as it is right now. Uh, we did have an increase in 2019 when compared to 2018. Um, our trend indicates that we have a record low proposed probably for this year. I'm predicting that we'll probably have under 200 uh, part one UCR crimes as we still have to go through the month of November and December. And the next slide 22 uh, shares with you the record uh, crime numbers that we've had uh, for the past uh, several years. 2018, we had a record low of 200. Uh, 2017, it was 212. 2016 was 217, and then we had 2019, 237 Part 1 crimes. And 237 was an uptick, but in the history of the park police, that's still the fifth lowest crime that we've had in our park system. And the next slide, 24. I want to show with y'all that it might be important that you all see that we do have a pretty large number of uh, calls for service, 104,000. But of the 104,000, uh, we have a relatively low use of force totals. So you see the use of force totals for 2016, 17, 18, and 19. We have 12 use of forces that are served by officers 2016, 8 in 2017, 7 in 2018, 7 in 2019. And so far in 2020, we've had nine use of forces. And 25, the next slide. Uh, kind of shows you, and uh, for 25, 26, 27, and slides 28, I believe, and 29, show you the types of use of force that we've trended to be using um, by our officers. Uh, next slide, 2031, uh, staffing for 2019. Uh, we've had a major change in some of our staffing, a lot of promotions. We've had a lot of staff in the last couple of years. So in 2019, we promoted one lieutenant, four sergeants, one communication supervisor. Uh, we filled four sergeant positions and one communications lead position. Uh, the next slide shows uh, some of the folks that we did hire uh, in 2019. And we also uh, hired 10 new officers, uh, five were advanced entries, which are officers with, with prior police experience, which came from other agencies throughout the region. And we had five that had to go to the academy as police officer candidates. We also hired two civilian staff for our communications. 
And the next slide, 33, uh, staffing for 2020. Uh, so far in 2020, uh, we promoted one captain, we promoted two lieutenants, uh, one sergeant. We had one staff person that was uh, promoted uh, from uh, an administrative position to a budget, budget manager, and another that received a promotion to administrative specialist one. We filled three park police officer positions, a senior tele telecommunications specialist, a video IT support specialist, security system specialist, and a security administrator. Uh, next slide, our achievements. Uh, for this year, I think it's important to know that we're always looking to be the best we can be. And this year we did a comprehensive review of our policies and procedures. We went through all of our divisional directives and policies and updated them uh, to be most current as, they, as we can be. Uh, we revised our use of force policy and we implemented a de-escalation policy uh, in June. Uh, we've offered career development training opportunities for all of our staff to include first line supervisor training. Uh, we had a field training officer school for our officers, not only in the park police, but throughout the local region. We had dispatcher training, and we also continued our community outreach with, uh, with the commission, of course, and with other organizations. Uh, so we had we participated in the grab and go events, food pantry events, meal giveaways. Uh, mini trail events to purple bicycle ride for domestic violence and we also participated uh, we've done that for the last couple of years uh community and the courthouse event with the state's attorney aisha brave boy and recently uh the park police and i was fortunate enough to be recognized as a recipient of the purple light bulb award from the sheriff's office for our work with domestic violence uh, 35 slide 35 uh training uh, training is very important. We want our, our officers to be up to date with their training and also have the most needed training to make sure we deliver uh, the proper service to our community. So we've had de-escalation training for all of our officers. Uh, this year they had training dealing with those suffering from mental illness. Uh, legal updates, we always want to be abreast of the most up-to-date uh, legal issues within the law enforcement community. Sexual assault and domestic violence training, first-line supervisor training, Again, the field training officer school that we hosted, dispatcher training. Every year, officers go through judgmental and tactical firearms training and also in service for officers for the Naloxo uh, for uh, prevention of those uh, addicted to drugs. Uh, page 36 and 37 kind of give you a graphical depiction of some of the events we participated in this year. And you'll see officers engaged with the community and let's go to slide number 38 some more activity the grab and go events and the last couple of slides is just uh, the number of officers that we have supervisors i think supervision is very important uh, of course we have a division chief three captains 11 lieutenants and 18 sergeants to provide supervision for all of our park police staff 40 we're authorized in case you wanted to know 135 officers 32 civilians and lastly, our goals for 2020 and 2021. So one of the goals was to do a review of our organizational roles and responsibilities. We completed that. We continued our career development training opportunities for our staff. Uh, we've begun the construction. Uh, that was one of the goals of the enterprise substation. Of course, that's on hold, it's delayed due to permitting. Our Walker Mill substation, we wanted that to be fully operational. Uh, that's being delayed due to permitting. And we're still working to fill all of our vacant positions. And I'm grateful that we did acquire two new officer positions for FY20, thanks to you all, and the uh, Park and Planning Commission, as well as the county approving that. And also three new IT specialist positions were filled uh, this year. Our goals for 2021 are to continue our downward trend uh, to reduce our crime by, by at least 5%, uh, to continue to improve our delivery of services to the community, uh, using the six pillars of 21st century policing. And we also want to begin the next phase of construction of our park police headquarters. Uh, it's my understanding that we're going to start demoing uh, by the end of the month or the early part of December to start our second phase, which would be relocating and uh, better facilities for our communication security operations center and providing 
uh, locker and room space and office space for our patrol services unit and investigative services unit. And lastly, uh, we've been accredited six times through CALEA. Our goal for this year is to receive our seventh accreditation award, which I anticipate we'll achieve in November of 2021. And that's my presentation. I know I only had a few minutes to share it with you, uh, but hopefully you guys have the presentation and can look at it in more detail. And right now, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Before, before I get to the questions, first of all, um, Chief, thank you so much for your presentation. And the PowerPoint that we each have is, is phenomenal because it tells you some more. Um, I, do want to, I do want to say that um, you know, no human being is, is absolutely perfect, but our, police, our Park Police Department is just really amazing. And you step up in so many conceivable ways, many of which you mentioned, but not everything. I mean, the way you helped out with the the, the elections and protecting the ballot boxes and 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 working on during the um, COVID testing sites and so many other things that you've done. This has been a a, um, a bizarre year, and you've stepped up in yes. every conceivable way. Um, you continue to work with domestic violence. I gave you a huge shout out publicly when you got the Purple um, Award, Purple Light Award. I don't think you were on though, but uh, the way you helped us with census, um, and also you all take your lives in your hand, and a lot of people don't do that. They think of park police as just having a relatively easy job. There's nothing easy about what you all do, and plus we have all these um, um, uh, agreements, um, MOUs with the um, county police and other municipal police forces as well, and you step up to, to help, and I mean, you put your lives on the line. I go to those award ceremonies, and you really, really do it, and uh, to hear the stories are, are phenomenal. Um, you also have helped us tremendously with the census and all our census efforts and, and Saturday and meal distributions and things like that. Um, it's just so many other things, and then during the protests, um, you were so phenomenal during the, the protests following the um, execution of George Floyd. You were phenomenal in so many ways. And, and in Prince George's County, when people protest, everybody protested peacefully. And when they protested, uh, protested near our properties, you were there to greet them and welcome them and actually walk with them. And I just thought that was pretty phenomenal as well. Um, so many other things. and. Um, and even in more recently, we, all of our p local police forces, including our park police, were on call for um, the, ele the November 3rd election and the aftermath, which is, continues to be an aftermath. Um, and uh, you, you've just stepped up in so many ways. And just so you know, uh, um, we are working on some of your permitting issues, too. I reached out to um, Melinda Bowling of the Department of um, Permitting Inspections Enforcement. And no, what did I think? Yeah. Um, and so, um, and all of this you do consistent with your motto because you care. So thank you so much. I'm going to see if you have any questions from anybody or any comments, but um, I would recommend that everyone carefully review this and, and keep this presentation because it, it is a keeper. Madam Vice Chair. Uh, I'd like to uh, associate myself with your comments. We do have an outstanding uh, park police uh, department they, they really do an outstanding job and engage in so many activities in the county so we're grateful for that however there's some personal information not personal in the sense of uh but something i, I need i uh, would like is information about your uh, your breakdown with females and and, and african americans I, I know it's not necessarily a part of the presentation but if you could get that to me at some other time uh we have done I would like to see that. I know you're doing an outstanding job in that area as well. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Commissioner Washington? No, uh, but thank you, Chief Johnson. This is this is an excellent presentation. And as Madam Chair said, definitely a keeper. And I applaud you all on the, uh, the trends with regards to uh, what's taking place in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Dorner? No comments. Thanks a bunch for all the, the support that you provided the community and the safety. Um, we definitely appreciate these are kind of odd times and there's a lot of um, animosity towards police. So it's nice to see we have such an active police force um, who is uh, who's not stepping over some of the boundaries that other communities are, are finding. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Geraldo. I, I read the presentation. I just want to thank the chief and all of his staff for the fine work and the, the acknowledgement that it's so important to engage the community. Thank you, Chief. 
And and while Thank I'm you. at it, while I'm at it, you know, this Sunday we had a big census event at one of our facilities. And while we were thanking everybody, including our park police who does so much, the park police turned around and thanked all of us who worked so hard for the census. I mean, just unbelievable. So we're so grateful. So thank you so much, Chief. And thank, thank you. Thank you. And if I can just say something very quickly sure. for um, Vice Chair Bailey. Mm -hmm. uh, I did have the demographics for our agency, but I can't find them right now. I do know that uh, on our agency, about 40% of our staff are female. And if it's in my mind correctly, I think about 45% are African American, uh, about 40 percent are Caucasian and then other races are the remainder. Okay. But uh okay. I, but we I can get that back. Yeah, if you can get, okay. get 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 something um a little later that would be helpful, okay, Chief? Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank and, you. and also I do want to close by saying that uh I, I feel fortunate. Uh what you mentioned is so true. I, I'm really grateful for the officers we have on the staff and their commitment during these trying times it's, it's been trying for us all and uh we've been able to fulfill the requirements of the community and the commission as a whole and i'm really grateful for that so i tell them all the time how much i do appreciate them and i say that to say that uh, we didn't have a regular wars program this year but we did something virtual to make sure they are recognized and i want to thank you uh, uh chair hewlett for uh, having a few words to share with those officers i know they appreciated that and also uh director tyler for the words he had to say uh, I know they appreciate that. So I just want to thank you all for your continued support. And uh, we just try our best to do what we can do for the community. I'm committed to that. Thank you so very much. And I do, I do know we have Director Tyler on the phone, on the on participating as well. Um, I do need to, um, so thank you everyone. And now I'm going to um, go to, uh, it's 11 o'clock, so we have our um, other items that we have to take. Um, so thank you everyone. And we all we have to begin with our announcements. Um, so as before we take our development review items, um, good morning everyone. I'm Elizabeth Hewlett, Chair of the Prince George's County Planning Board of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. And the planning board um, has been in session since 10 o'clock, but we were doing more administrative things and presentations and closed session. Um, but now we're about to take our development review items. So we are in session for um, Thursday, November the 19th, 2020. And in an abundance of caution resulting from the global spread of the COVID-19 virus, this is the planning board's 29th, 29th virtual meeting since March. During these continued challenging times, we remain committed to promoting a safe and healthy environment for our public, applicants, stakeholders, and staff as we continue business operations to propel Ch Prince George's County forward. Um, before commencing with everything, I do want to announce that we have in the room, we have, I'm going to do a check to make sure everyone can see that we have all of our planning board members. Madam Vice Chair? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, okay, so Commissioner Washington? Present. Okay. Commissioner Dorner? Good morning. Commissioner Geraldo? Good morning. Wonderful. We have in the hearing room with me, we have our planning director, Andre Checkley. We have our planning board administrator, Jessica Jones. We have our technical hearing writer, Lee Kratka. We have Kenny Flanagan, senior planning technician working the PowerPoint. We have Ryan Cron, vision, visual media specialist, just doing everything back there, doing all the troubleshooting. He comes to save the day all the time. We have legal counsel with us today, um, senior legal counsel Peter Goldsmith, and we have um, James Hunt, Chief of Development Review. I'd like to take a moment to remind everyone of the participation guidelines for our hearings. These are depicted on the screen, but let me remind everyone that speaker pre-registration and pre-submission of comments and exhibits is required. All participants must pre-register and any materials or exhibits must be submitted by 12 noon on the Tuesday before the planning board meeting as shown on the screen, announced in weekly meetings, posted on our website, and clearly stated in bold red on our published weekly um, planning board agenda. Registered speakers and presenters connecting through a computer, tablet, or smartphone can join the meeting with the link provided via email from the planning board office. 
Online registered participants may be prompted to install GoToMeeting software in order to participate in the process. Registered speakers may also listen or participate using the phone line and the phone call and number provided via the email. We ask all participants to mute your phones when not speaking and please do not put your phone on hold. Um, of course, the public may continue to watch planning board meetings streamed live or if you wish to become a person of record, you may sign up on our online web form and please note the screen for instructions. As always, uh -uh. We commence our meeting. I don't see my moment of silence. Okay. Um, I'll come back to our moment of silence. Um, oh, no, we have it. Okay. So we always commence our meetings with a moment of silence in honor of the individuals and loved ones um, throughout our community and nation who passed away since our last meeting on November the 12th. Within our commission family, we want to rem uh, remember Mike Brett. Mike Brett was a retiree with a 37-year career with the Department of Parks and Recreation. He held leadership positions in all regions of the county, community director at Deerfield Run Community Center in Laurel, programming for the Montpelier Festival, and as assistant superintendent for the Central Area Maintenance at Watkins Park, enhancing the Kinderfest and Winter Festival of Lights. Um, we are keeping um, um, his family, especially his wife, Christine, who is also a former commission employee um, retire and retiree. We're keeping them in our thoughts um, and prayers. Within Prince George's County, Joe Robinson, age 87, was the former mayor and council member for the city of Laurel, and he was a member of the Laurel Historical Society. He was a fixture in the fire and rescue community, served in the Maryland State Forestry Department, 33 years on the Prince George's County Fire Commission, and was also past president of the Maryland State Firemen's Association and other organizations. Um, the growing number of victims of the widespread coronavirus. More than 11.6 million cases that we have now. And two, over 250,000 deaths in the United States alone. It is rapidly escalating throughout the country, including Maryland, where um, 2018 new cases were reported just yesterday. It was the first time that we hit over 2,000 in one day. And we have had over 1,000 or, or 1,000 or more cases each day in the last 15 days. So we want to remember everyone who has succumbed to this um, deadly virus and remember um, their families and that remind everyone to keep safe. We want to re remember Jim Pace, who was a professional sports car racing driver, um, a Daytona 24 and Sebring 12 winner, who also died of the COVID. Throughout the nation and the world, we want to remember Edward Perkins, age 92, the first African-American U.S. ambassador um, um, to apartheid South Africa. Uh, Paul Hornick, Hall of Fame and MVP at um, National Football League running back, who won four national titles and the first ever Super Bowl, um, Green Bay Packers and a Heisman Trophy at the University of Notre Dame, Notre Dame rather. Ben Watkins, only age 14, he was a former contestant on Master Chef Junior, who appeared on the show when he was only 11 years old, and he died after a year and a half battle with cancer. Doug Supernaw, country music singer known for his number one hit, I Don't Call Him Daddy. Tracy Davis, author and daughter of Sammy Davis Jr. Nikki McKibben, age 42. She was the American Idol finalist who died on Sunday from a brain aneurysm. And Bobby Brown Jr., the son of singer Bobby Brown, um, who was his second child to die. As we know, Bobby Christina died a few years ago as well. And of course, we extend our deepest sympathy to any of you who may have suffered a loss to our hearts. We extend our hearts to each and every one of you. If we may have that moment of silence, please. Thank you. Okay, announcements. It's the month of November. We are still celebrating. We continue to celebrate American Indian Heritage Month. 
We um, recognize that it is lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, and stomach cancer awareness month, epilepsy awareness month, national caregivers month. We have to remember all the caregivers because very often caregivers don't take care of themselves as they care for others. National Adoption Month, still many children to be adopted. Aviation History Month, History Month. We want to um, always celebrate that, and, and in, especially in view that we own the oldest continuously operating airport in the world, which is College Park Airport. It is Military Family Appreciation Month. Of course, we celebrate Veterans Day this month on November 11th, but military families sacrifice an awful lot, and we want to extend our appreciation to all military family members. It is No Shave Ember Month, and clearly Commissioner um, Dorner has gotten with the No Shave Ember program. Um, okay, so, um, and then of course it is National um, Gratitude Month. Okay, so um, I need to pause for a second. Can you turn my mic off for a second? Ryan? Because I'm getting ready to hold something up for someone to see, so my camera's not working at all? Oh, uh, great. Yeah, just, well, we can pause for one moment. Okay. Yeah. Can you put a, put a sign up? Oh, no, put the mic back on for a second. We're having technical dif difficulties for a second. Um, so, um, hold tight. Thank you. Um, difficulties. Um, someone asked if, um, let me do this. Someone asked if um, um, item 3E was going to be last. Yes, 3E, I mentioned it, I thought I mentioned it earlier, it's going to be last okay. after development, um, the development review items. Okay. Um, and I had, the last thing I said was it's No Shave Ember Month, and we congratulate Commissioner Dorner for, get, for going with the program. But most important, it is National Gratitude Month. And I'm going to come back to that, but we need to keep okay. that at the forefront. It is National okay. Gratitude Month. Um, this week, November 15th to the 22nd, is National Hunger and Homeless Awareness Week. Um, it is if you can donate, donate. There are more people who are hungry this time than any other time, which will bring us to Trot for a Turkey, which is on this coming Saturday. Um, we are raising money to distribute turkeys to families in need, but there's so many other ways that we can donate. It is also Random Act of Kindness Week. I would submit that we um, just continue to engage in Random Acts of Kindness or step it up. Um, November, it is na also it's American Education Week. November 19th is the Great American Smokeout, sponsored by the American Cancer Society, and always the third Thursday in November. It's a challenge to smokers to give up smoking for 24 hours, a first step towards quitting forever. November 19th, 1805, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, also known as Lewis and Clark, reached the Pacific Ocean, the first European Americans to cross to the West. Um, at but, of course, they were guided by, for thousands of miles by a brave, young, 16-year-old, a Native American girl named Sacagawea. So we want to remember her. We can never talk about Lewis and Clark without Sacagawea. So we want to remember her as well. Um, eight, on this day, November 19, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln delivered his Gettysburg Address. Um, in 1975, um, release of the iconic Oscar-winning best picture, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Now, yeah, I'm going to bite my tongue. But um, remember the brutally oppressive Nurch Ratched? 2019, uh, Laker, Los Angeles Laker, LeBron James scored 25 points, 11 rebounds, and 10 assists to become the first player in NBA history to record a triple-double against all 30 franchises. And that game was Lakers versus Oklahoma City Thunder. And speaking of basketball, last night's NBA draft pick, um, we had a couple of interesting things. First of all, the home team Wizards drafted um, Denny Abdija. So that's one we want to keep a lookout for. 
And also, our own University of Maryland basketball player, Jalen Smith, was drafted 10th overall by the Phoenix Suns. And finally in sports, both local National Football League teams play on Thanksgiving Day. Our Washington team will take on the Dallas Cowboys. Uh-oh, here we go. And then also our Baltimore Ravens will take on the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, planning Department. The Planning Department, um, the Adelphi Road. So please join the Planning Department for a virtual community meeting and project kickoff for a new sector plan. The Adelphi Road, um, U um, University of Maryland, Purple Line Station area. It will be Wednesday, December the 9th, 2020 from 7 to 8.30 p.m. The project team will provide an overview and discuss plans. This is, that's not the same one I have, okay. The project team will provide an overview and discuss plans for future development in the plan area and surrounding neighborhoods. This is, um, this is the slide for this. You don't have that slide, okay. Well, anyway, okay. Um, and then we have the cultural arts study. The Department of Parks and Recreation, the Planning Department, and the Prince George's um, County Arts and Humanities Council are conducting a study to learn more about how you connect with the arts and cultural expressions in the county. So please take 10 minutes to complete the online survey. You can look right there on the screen and figure and to um, complete the survey or visit pgplanning.org. Um, finally, and I am so excited to present this, the Department of Parks and Recreation presents their annual Winter Festival of Lights. So please add a, ch a little cheer and twinkle to this holiday season. I'm telling you, we are all under stress. It, it permeates every aspect of our lives and no one is immune from the stress. But when you drive through the amazing Festival of Lights that our team, our Department of Parks and Recreation team has spent, I mean, days upon days and months constructing those lights and those other displays, um, you and your family will so enjoy it and you're, you can feel the, the stress leaving your body at that time. So I would invite you to join, to, to drive through and it's safe. You can just drive through. And some people need to get out the house. So just drive through and enjoy um, the 2.5 million lights and the 54 foot um, LED musical tree. Um, and also, it, if ever we needed such a dazzling, uplifting, um, but safe drive through experience, this is it. So it starts November 27th on a Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, so, and, and continues to January 1st, 2021, nightly from 5 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. And you can purchase tickets in advance at pgparksdirect.com. Also, you can see the Trot for Turkey that I just mentioned. That will be Saturday, um, November 21st. I think it's full now, but you can still donate to, to um, help purchase turkeys for families in need. Finally, uh, um, I also want to say happy birthday to Michael Cosby of the planning department. And I also want to say we've worked so, so very hard for census. But we have an amazing person who we snatched immediately upon her retiring. You got it? From, not, well, not that one. That, well, that too. Immediately upon her retiring from county government. Um, and that was so amazing. And that is the inimitable Jackie Woody. So we snatched her to help because she's worked with census decade after decade. I don't want to go say how many decades, but she's worked so hard. She's an amazing census veteran. And, and largely due to her efforts, we were able to reach our, a goal of 70%, which was amazing in and of itself. We surpassed our 2010 goal our numbers, our self-response numbers, um, and that is Jackie on the left, and we have the other one, right? Okay, somehow you don't have the slides, okay. So this is the one we're, we're okay, so I'm gonna see that, can you get it up, get this up there? Thank you. I thought, um, Calista said she sent them, okay. Um, so anyway, if we can, if we can get those up, um, that would be really, really nice. Um, and we want to, we have a proclamation for Jackie, and I know she's watching now. So, um, um, so we're, and the, the planning board adopted this, and whereas the public servant, ever the public servant, Jacqueline Woody, graciously agreed to join the commission team in order to serve the residents of Prince George's County as a dedicated team member and leader on the census 
coordination team for the Prince George's County Complete Count Committee during the 2020 decennial census and says so many other th wonderful things about it, about her. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Prince George's County Planning Board of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission commends Jacqueline Woody for her outstanding service and thanks Jackie for her commitment to ensuring that every Prince Georgian counts in the 2020 census. Can we get this? Can, can you focus in on this? Can't see it. Why can't we see it? That's what I'm asking. The camera, the camera's not working? No. No, but I can't, you can't, oh. yeah. That, you didn't get that? No. Okay. You want me to just put this in front of there? Or what you okay, well, for, I just, on now. okay, so, so this is the resolution, Jackie. We, we are saying congratulations to you. Um, we snatched your census is over, so your contract with us to do census is, has come to an end, but we cannot do this. Uh, we must say thank you. Um, Ryan? And also... Again. Okay. And then we have, thank you so much, Jackie Woody. So can we give her a round of applause? Thank you. And with that, okay, with that, we're going to go to a um, couple other things. So first we have the draft resolutions, um, items 4A, B, 4D, and 4E. Um, is there any board member who wishes to discuss these items? And if not, is there a motion? Move we'll approval, Madam Chair. Oh, thank you. Um, we have a, second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, Aye. Madam Vice Chair. Aye. Madam Vice Chair. But I. Com um, Commissioner Washington. Aye. Commissioner Geraldo. I vote aye. Commissioner Dorner. Aye. Okay. And then the other thing I meant to say is that um, before we go into the substantive cases, um, we thank you and appreciate each and everyone's flexibility, cooperation, and support as we continue to keep our planning functions moving forward in a safe fashion during our new normal. We ask that you make every effort to stay safe, to look out for one another, to stay strong, stay resilient, and remain ever hopeful as we strive to get through these challenging t times together. We may not be able to celebrate Thanksgiving with our families and with our friends to the extent that we would like to. Some of us may be by ourselves, but it's okay. It is National Gratitude Month, and that's the thing that we need to focus on. Even in the midst of this escalating pandemic and other madness, each of us has plenty for which to be thankful. You know it. You just need to stop and think about it. I invite everyone to examine their plus column. And yes, we have a lot in our minus column, a lot of woes, but focus on that plus column. Take some time to think about it and remember to be grateful for everything in that plus column. Um, so um, with that, we will. Uh, this will be our last planning board meeting until December 3rd because next Thursday is Thanksgiving. So. I wanted to impart Happy Thanksgiving to everyone and remember to be grateful. That is what we do. We give thanks on Thanksgiving. Um, okay. Next thing is, um, okay, so next case we have is item 5A, followed, perhaps followed by 5B. I need to do a check. Um, Mr. Bossy, are you on? Yes, good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Corrine Anyanwu, are you on? Anyanwu. Yes, and how, how do I pronounce it? Anyanwu. Uh, Anyanwu, so you're clearly present. Okay, so I have a, a very long um, comprehensive design plan statement that I'm supposed to read for this. Um, I don't know if... Um, Stan Brown, People's Owning Council, is on or not? But, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Brown contacted us. I believe it was yesterday to let us know he would not be on okay. today's meeting. Okay, thank but you. But he was invited. Thank you so much. Okay, so, um, Mr. Bossy, if, what I see right now is that we have a problem with the posting um, of, of for this case, and I. 
and you can explain it, but I think it's the posting fell short for at least a week, and for about a week, and that is problematic for us for a le from a legal standpoint. So I can mm -hmm. tell you where my position is right now. Legally, I don't believe we can we can entertain this request, notwithstanding the fact that we don't appear to have any. Um, opposition or anybody else signed up but from a legal standpoint um, I don't think we can handle we can entertain this request right now but we are happy to continue it to December the 3rd um, I will um, Mr. Bossy if you have anything else to add on this um, you know please feel free and you can because uh, because we have to entertain that first before we get to the substantive case, if in fact we get to the substantive case. So, Mr. Bossy, you're on with regard to the posting matter. Uh, yes, Madam Chairwoman, you summed it up uh, exactly correctly. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, posting did not occur until about a week later than it should have. I believe the site as of today has been posted for 23 of the, the 30 required days. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Bossy. Okay, Ms. Anyanwu, can you tell? Is that? Can you uh, speak up? Is can you tell us what day it was posted? Yes, ma'am. Um, it was posted on October the twenty seventh. There was a miscommunication in my understanding of when it needed to be posted, so I do um, take responsibility for that. However, um, knowing everything that has been presented, and knowing that. Um, my HOA has approved the building of the deck um, where my house is located. My neighbors have been informed. There is force retention around my home. Um, you can, I'm assuming once you get a chance to see everything, you'll see that there's, I'm right at the end of a cul-de-sac. So I am just asking um, and standing in expectation of gratitude month that you all possibly waive that requirement for the, the 30 days because um, today makes actually the 24th day. Okay, Ms. Anyanwu, my, my, my problem with that is it may, make, it may seem harmless in this particular case, but we have folks who watch these hearings week in and week out, and the next thing you know, everybody, in the, everybody will be asking for that one week. Um, there is such a doctrine of substantial compliance. This one week goes far beyond that, and I, I can't see, honestly, how we can do this case, but we'll be happy to take it. Um, early on, on and, I'm, and I regret we can't do it next week either because of Thanksgiving, but we can do it on December the 3rd. Mm -hmm. um, does, the, does the board have any questions of either? No, I don't. No questions, Madam Chair. Uh, and uh, uh, Ms. On, on, on you, uh, well, the, the chair has said it all. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to move that we continue the case to December 3rd, 2020. And I'll I do wish that. you a happy Thanksgiving. Sorry about this, but it's just legal. We're, we're, we're tied, so. I'll second the motion. Okay. And, we, uh, Sharon, and Commissioner Washington's comment. Thank you. We have, um, we, we have um, a motion by Commissioner Washington, seconded by Commissioner Geraldo under discussion. Okay, so we talked about gratitude. Okay, it's just a minute ago. So we wish you the best Thanksgiving ever. Well, maybe not ever, but a, a really good, safe uh, Thanksgiving. <laughs> and focus on that plus column because you will be coming back on December 3rd and you've got all those um, approvals from your homeowners association, what have you. So just hold that in the forefront of your, of your mind. Um, uh, so we have a motion and a second. Is there any additional discussion? Um, Madam Vice Chair? I vote aye. Commissioner Washington? I vote aye. Commissioner Geraldo? I vote aye. Commissioner Dorner? Aye. Okay, and um, uh, we will work to make sure that you're earlier in the agenda for the, for the tw third, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Covering. Thank, Thank you. you. So, Thank you. Thank you for understanding. So that, and that Thank would you. be, the motion to continue was for items 5A and B, just so we're clear, okay? Um, yes. The, the next case is item 8. Um, we have a mandatory referral 2021 F Prince George's County canine facility. Mr. Kowalik. Good morning, Madam Chair uh, and members of the board. Uh, for the record, Ted Kowalik with the special project section. Uh, here to seek your approval to transmit staff's comments regarding MR 
2021F, it's a Prince George's County canine training facility. Next slide, please. Uh, this general location map, the project is located on the southern edge of Councilmatic District 6 in planning area 79. Next slide. Here is an aerial of the site outlined in red. Uh, the project will be located in that gravel parking area to, to the north of the site. Um, the entire site's 131 acres and that parking area is roughly 4.75 acres. Next slide, slide please. Uh, this is uh, the vicinity map. Uh, the site it will be accessed from Dilly Drive. Um, there is also a site uh, access to the property off of Ritchie Marlboro Road. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a uh, map of the natural features. Uh, it does contain some uh, vegetation and wooded areas as well as some stream areas. Uh, next slide, please. The property is zoned RR and the predominant zone in the area is RR. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a slide of the master plan right away. Um, the, the proposed facility is um, not uh, located in that uh, Dilly Drive extension. Um, uh, and they will extend Dilly Drive at the end that's shown on the on the site on the uh, master plan right away to the facility. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a picture of the site plan uh, for the project. And next slide. Uh, the project uh, description will be a 10,000 square foot, one story masonry building with 21 parking uh, site spaces. Uh, will operate during normal business hours and the county hopes to begin construction this winter uh, uh, and with completion in the summer of 2021. Uh, slide 10, please. Staff's recommendations. Uh, there's a requirement that uh, you provide a uh, uh, parking island with a tree for every 10 contiguous parking spaces. They will have a row of 11 spaces. Um, and so what we're recommending is that they plant a tree adjacent to that 11th parking space um, on the south side of the micro bioretention facility number five. Uh, recommendations two and three are just a notice that a revised TP TCP2 will be required uh, prior to the issuance of a permit and the environmental section recommends that the applicant should make every effort to minimize impact to all regulated environmental features and revise with the revised tree conservation plan. And that concludes staff's presentation. Thank you, Mr. Kamala. Um, so um, let's see if the board has any questions of you. And I don't think we have anyone else signed up on this. I had no one else on my sign-up sheet. So um, we'll see if there are any questions. And if not, we'll, we'll entertain a motion after that. Madam Vice Chair? No questions, thank you. Commissioner Washington? No question. Commissioner Geraldo? I have no questions, Madam Chair. Commissioner Dorner? No questions. Okay, is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move that we uh, accept staff's recommendation and approve transmittal of MR-2021F to Mr. Wayne McBride, uh, DCAO for Public Safety. Second. We have a motion and a second. Um, uh, Commissioner Washington seconded by, by Vice Chair Bailey. Madam Vice Chair? But aye. Commissioner Washington? Aye. Commissioner Dorner? Aye. Um, Commissioner Geraldo? Aye. Um, the ayes have it 5 0. Um, thank you. And, and Mr. Kowalik, it was good to see you. We haven't seen you in a long, long, long time. Thank you. And I just got my uh, my my laptop and and I forgot to turn on the camera. Sorry well, about it's that. It's on now, so that's okay. Day. No worries. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, the next items are items six and seven, which are companion cases. 
Um, detailed site plan 20016, um, alternative compliance 20009, and departure from design standard 670, all for PMG Brooks Drive. Mr. Bossy, are you still on? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Mr. Lynch? Present. Okay, um, those are the only two I have signed up on this case. So, uh, Mr. Bossy, and we need to mute everyone else. Mr. Bossy? All right, well, thank you, Madam Chairwoman and members of the planning board. Uh, great to be back in front of you again this morning. Uh, for the record, I'm Adam Bossy with the urban design section. And as the chair mentioned, these are items six and seven, a detailed site plan, D. Uh -oh. SP20016 and departure from design saying oops I'm sorry uh, and departure okay, from we're design good standards okay. we were having technical difficulties Madam here Chairwoman. yeah we were having technical difficulties for a second but you're good Mr. Bossy okay thank you uh, a little, uh, so a little as, turbulence as you mentioned, these are items six and seven the uh, DSP 20016 and departure from design standards D, uh, DS 670 uh, there is also the request for alternative compliance, AC-20009, uh, that is a companion to the DSP. Uh, the project that is proposed via these applications uh, is the redevelopment of an existing gas station site uh, to include a new gas station and a food and beverage store. Uh, as we get started here, I do want to point out two items were submitted into the board's additional backup record uh, earlier this week, which include uh, applicants exhibit one, which is a uh, proposed revision to condition 1A of the staff report, uh, as well as staff exhibit one, which is a presentation regarding pedestrian access uh, at the subject site. I'll talk a little bit more about those exhibits uh, further in the presentation, but I would like to go through some of the basic, basic information first. Sure. Uh, so if we could move on to slide two, please. Uh, the subject property is in planning area 75A, Council District 7. Uh, slide three, please. Outlined in red, we see the subject site is located in the southwest quadrant of the intersection of Brooks Drive and Marlboro Pike. Slide four, please. Subject property is zoned commercial miscellaneous, marked here as CM, uh, so it's a CM zone. Uh, and is bound by a single property in the commercial shopping center zone. That's the red CSC zone shown on the map. Uh, the site is also bound by the rights away of Brooks Drive and Marlboro Pike. Slide five, please. Uh, the aerial image here shows the subject site in context with the surrounding development. The CSC zone property to the southeast of the site is developed with a car wash and an oil change operation. And as you can see here, the subject site is relatively small and measures in at 0 0.6 acres in area. Uh, slide six, please. The topographic map shows the site itself gently slopes away from Marlboro Road, down gradient toward the site's westernmost corner with Brooks Drive. Slide seven, please. Uh, Marlboro Pike, which is shown here in green, is classified as a master plan collector roadway. Slide eight, please. Uh, here with this bird's eye view, we do see that the existing site and its gas station uh, that were constructed in the 1970s are, are fairly centrally located in the site. Uh, there are no other buildings that exist on the site today. Um, we do see that there are a total of four access points that are provided to the abutting roadways, uh, right in, right out of Brooks Drive and two full movement uh, points at Marlboro Pike. Slide nine, please. Uh, this overlay shows the proposed development program on top of the existing condition aerial image for the site. Here we can see the new gas station canopy will be uh, located in the central portion of the site uh, and a 3,000 square foot food and beverage store will be located in that bottom left corner. Uh, slide 10 please. So looking a bit closer at the site plan, uh, we do see here again the proposed food and beverage store in the lower left hand corner of the property with parking provided directly in front of it. Uh, trash enclosure is provided to the left of the building and loading space to its right. Uh, the gas station canopy with six fuel dispensers is located in the central portion of the site and six additional parking spaces are provided a little bit closer to the intersection of Brooks Drive and Marlboro Pike. A standard sidewalk is provided along the front of the building 
uh, to Brooks Drive and connects with existing sidewalks uh, along the roadway. Two of the four previously existing access points to the roadways have been removed uh, with the proposal. So now there will be one uh, access point to Brooks Drive and one to Marlboro Pike. Um, given the tight nature of the site, the applicant did file the requested departure to reduce the size of standard parking spaces to nine feet by 18 feet instead of the typical nine and a half by 19. And again, given the small size of the site and nature of this proposed use, SAP does support the departure request. Uh, with this slide, I would also like to briefly address the two additional exhibits submitted into the board's record. Uh, both, both of the applicant and staff exhibits are related to condition 1A of the staff report, which um, requires that prior to certification of the DSP, a walkable connection of some sort be provided between the food and beverage store and Marlboro Pike. Uh, shown on the image, that's really that lowest area where Kenny is running the person now uh, to the right of the building over to Marlboro Pike. Um, staff and the applicant have spent a, a considerable amount of time uh, and effort looking at this area to try to find a mutually agreeable uh, design solution and associated condition language uh, that we all find appropriate for providing that uh, uh, walkable connection to Marlboro Pike. As of yesterday afternoon, it is my understanding that Mr. Lynch will suggest some new language today for Condition 1A for the board to consider, and that may limit the need for us to, to really get into a longer discussion about the, uh, about the exhibits submitted earlier this week. Slide 11, please. Regarding conformance with the landscape manual, uh, the companion alternative compliance request provides for landscape designs uh, for section 4.2. It's a landscape strip that's required along Brooks Drive uh, at the top of the site in the image and a section 4.6 buffer along Marlboro Road on the right side of the site. On each of these roadside areas, there is a 10 foot wide uh, landscaping area that does need to be provided under normal conditions. Uh, but here, again, due to the tight nature of the site and the need to maintain drive aisle widths around the gas station, uh, the applicant has uh, requested to reduce that buffer width to eight feet in some areas. Uh, they have provided and slightly exceeded the required number of plant units for both section 4, 2, and 4, 6. And staff has found these alternative landscape treatments uh, acceptable and does recommend approval of the alternative compliance request. Slide 12, please. The proposed 3,000 square foot food and beverage store is approximately 25 feet in height. It's a single story and triangular in shape. Uh, the front facade of the building will face north in, into the gas station site. Uh, the building elevation drawings here uh, with the DSP are missing some key details. So staff did recommend the condition that those be revised and provided prior to certification of the DSP. Slide 13, please. Oops. Here, if we <laughs> to tilt our heads to the side, uh, we do see the gas station canopy that is provided with this application. It's approximately 86 feet long, 37 feet wide, and 20 feet in height. Uh, a total of six multi-product dispensers are proposed with this, and the uh, facade of the canopy is faced with a branded sign and logo. Slide 14, please. Comprehensive signage program is provided uh, that includes freestanding canopy mounted and building mounted signs. Uh, here the canopy mounted signage area was not provided on the DSP and the signage does appear it may be slightly larger than is uh, permissive uh, by section 27613. Uh, again, in this instance, staff has recommended a condition uh, for the signage plan to be revised prior to certification. Uh, in conclusion, Madam Chair, and members of the Planning Board, through our review, staff has found that the development of a food and beverage store and gas station, as proposed by this DSP, can be approved subject to the conditions in the technical staff report. As noted earlier, staff is also supportive of the applicant's requested departure from design standards, as well as the alternative compliance request. Uh, Madam Chair, understanding that staff expects the applicant to introduce new language for consideration uh, regarding Condition 1A after completion of this presentation, our recommendation at this time is for the board to approve uh, detailed site plan DSP 20016, departure from design standards uh, DDS 670, and AC 20009, 
subject to the conditions as provided in the technical staff report. Again, with the understanding we're not finished discussing the language for condition 1A. Thank you. That concludes our presentation. Thank you, Mr. Bassi. As always, such a smooth landing. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see if there are any questions of you at this time. Um, Madam Vice Chair. No questions. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Washington. No questions. Thank you. Commissioner Dorner. Yeah, I just want to know what exactly is not sort of like done with the discussions on, on the, the revised condition of 1A. Is it the usage of like the decorative footpath instead of actually calling it like a pedestrian connection or like the usage of pavers instead of sidewalks? Okay. Um, where's kind of the hang up? Commissioner Dorner, I think I think um, we, we have the applicant's exhibit um, one, which has proposed substitute language. But what I am sensing from um, Mr. Bossi is that the applicant, when we get to him, has some further revisions. I, I think that, and but we haven't heard them yet. I think that's what okay. it is. Um, okay, we, that's correct, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, Commissioner Geraldo. No, I had the same questions as Commissioner Dorn, so I'll just wait for okay. Mr. Lynch. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Lynch, you're on. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. For the record, Dan Lynch with the law firm of Mac Mayhose here on behalf of PMG. We're here today, as indicated by Mr. Bossi, on a detailed site plan and departure from design standards relative to an existing gas station located on Brooks Drive and Marble Pike. Um, the purpose of this application is to allow for the entire existing gas station to be re raised and replaced with a um, new gas presentation and food and beverage store. Um, at the present time, the, the applicant agrees with the staff's recommendation and with one exception agrees with the staff's recommended, recommended conditions of approval. Um, the only issue we have and is with condition 1A. And it's more of a cleanup item and the change is really a direct result out of the ongoing discussions we had with staff up until yesterday as to how to address um, a connection between Marlboro Pike and the food and beverage store. Um, that being said, uh, we have completely revised condition 1A and my suggestion is as follows. Okay, wait again, a minute. Hold up, hold up, Mr. Lynch. Language. Hold up, Mr. Lynch. So right now, should we be working from your exhibit number one? Are you revising it from that or are you revising it from, from the, the staff report? I'm revising it from the original condition okay. 1A. Okay. Okay. And then do you would it be helpful if, if Mr. Flanagan here um, pulled, pulled an exhibit up for you to see? Uh, no, because what I'm asking for is just a complete deletion of condition 1A and substitute language. Okay. 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 And the substitute language would read as follows. Provide a walkable path from Marlboro Pike to the entrance of the food and beverage store that does not overlap with the loading space. Can, can you say that again? Did you get Slowly. That? Slowly. And again, I apologize for the last minute change. Okay. Should we provide a walkable path from Marlboro Pike to the entrance of the food and beverage store that does not overlap with the loading space? Okay, because we're going to have to, to, okay, so provide a walkable path from the Marlboro Pike to an entrance to the food and beverage store that does not, what? Overlap with the loading space. Okay. And is that it? Mean that it does, do you mean that it does not traverse the loading space? That's correct. Okay, so is that it? That is that the extent of your revision, the whole, your substitute condition? That's the extent of my revision. Okay, Mr. Bossi. Okay. That's it. And oh no, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, and and again, I, I'd like to thank Mr. Bossi. We really 
kind of had to work on coming up with a solution to provide some type of connection between Marble Pike and the food and beverage store. We already have, as indicated during Mr. Hasse's presentation, a connection from Brooks Drive to the food and beverage store, and staff was interested in providing some type of connection. Our problem was that there's just limited space to provide the loading space and at the same time provide that connection. So we came up with this language, which we feel will get everyone to where they want to be in terms of some type of walkable connection between the street and the food and beverage store. So that's why this condition works for both us and for staff. Okay. So that's, but we need to hear that from Mr. Bossie. But I, does that conclude your presentation pretty much, Mr. Lynch? Yes, unless the board has any questions. Okay. First, let's hear from Mr. Bossie and then I'll go to the board. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board. That is the language that I was, I was hoping to hear as far as revised condition one from Mr. Lynch. As he mentioned, we've spent quite a bit of time over the past week or so really trying to hammer out what we felt was an appropriate and workable solution to provide some form of pedestrian connection over to Marlboro Pike from this new food and beverage store. And we do think that this, this language is appropriate and will allow for that. Wonderful. Okay. We're getting some feedback. So after this case and before we get to the next one, we're going to, I'm going to take a, maybe two minutes to see if we can fix this. Okay. Now let's see if the board has any questions of either Mr. Lynch or Mr. Bossie now. Madam Vice Chair. No questions. We're glad to see the pedestrian connection work out to an agreement. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Commissioner Washington. No question. Commissioner Geraldo. No questions. Okay. Commissioner Dorner. No questions. I'll second the comments of Vice Chair. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. So if there are no other comments and no other speakers, we can entertain a motion. Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve DDS-670 and DSP-20016 and AC-20009 along with the conditions as outlined in staff's report with the following modifications. We will eliminate condition B1A in staff's report and replace it with new B1A based on the languages read into the record by Mr. Lynch. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Washington and seconded by Vice Chair Bailey. Let's see if there's any discussion. Madam Vice Chair. Vote aye. Commissioner Washington. Aye. Commissioner Geraldo. Vote aye. Commissioner Dorner. Aye. The ayes have it, 5-0. Thank you. Now I know I said something about... Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Happy Thanksgiving to you, Nessie. Don't you feel a sense of gratitude now? I have a sense of gratitude for Mr. Bossie's very creative skills in working out solutions to this problem. See? There we go. There's always something in our plus column. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Enjoy your holiday. Thank you. You too. So now, let me... Okay, this... Do we think that this situation is resolved? So it's resolved. So we can go ahead now to item 3E. Well, Madam Chair, we're still getting a little playback on our end, so I'm not sure if it's... Okay, I don't mean any harm, but I'm told over here that it's Mr. Lynch. Oh, oh. Bye, Mr. Lynch. Oh, he wants to stay with us. Okay. Okay, so are we, so are you still getting feedback now? No, and it looks like Mr. Lynch is frozen, so it may have been on his side. Okay. Okay. All right, well, let's, can we give it a try? I mean, are we, are we sort of okay? 
Sufficient enough? Okay. So let's go. Yeah, I, think we're, I don't hear any more feedback. Okay, wonderful. Okay. So, um, all right, so we're going to go to item 3E. And I understand before I go to item 3E, um, we, uh, Mr. Rowe or, or uh, Ms. Reynolds, did you want to make a, a statement first? No. No. Oh, that's what you're saying. Okay. Okay. So, um, yes. Okay. I'm listening. I'll let Scott uh, introduce, but we're excited to be here today to present the activities of the long range planning section. Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. For the record, Scott Rowe with the long range planning section. Uh, I do want to, uh, we're going to present our, our uh, ongoing activities right now, but I do want to introduce two new staff members to the board, uh, one of whom has appeared before you before, but another one who this is his first time. Um, first, uh, Sarah Benton, who is a planner coordinator. She joined us uh, last winter and is the project manager for the West Hydesville Queens Chapel sector plan. Uh, she's a plan uh, she joined our team in February, um, and she previously worked as a planner with the Inter-American Development Bank in Washington, D.C., where she worked with the Housing and Urban Development Division on city planning and sustainability in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, Sarah earned a master's in urban and regional planning, as well as a master's in Latin American studies from the University of Florida. Uh, she speaks Spanish and Brazilian Portuguese and has a passion for Hispanic outreach and planning for an aging population. Uh, Sarah enjoys food and travel and often these two things go together. Um, she's excited to be working here at the department. Um, as you know, uh, Sarah led our Spanish language uh, kickoff meeting for the West Hyattsville Queens Chapel sector plan, which was well received. Uh, the second person I'd like to introduce this morning is Michael Calamis. Uh, Michael's a senior planner in the long range planning section. He's uh, serves as the deputy project manager for the Adelphi Road UMGC UMD Purple Line Station Area sector plan. Uh, before he came to work for us, he's, uh, he worked for the state of Illinois as an economic development representative for the state's Main Street program uh, and for the National Trust for Historic Preservation in Washington, D.C. Uh, as a Main Street program associate. Uh, Michael also previously worked at the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning and participated in the creation of the Chicago Region's 2040 uh, Regional Comprehensive Plan. Um, uh, Michael then joined the staff at Northern, Northeastern Illinois University as a community outreach specialist. Uh, he has a Bachelor of Arts in American Studies and a Master of Urban Planning and Policy. Um, with that, uh, if we could go to the next slide. Thanks. I, I just wanted to point out this morning briefly that uh, with uh, our hires uh, this fall, we have completed the staffing of our team for its fiscal year 21 staffing level. Uh, these are the staff in the long range planning section. Uh, not pictured is our uh, graduate assistant, Kenny Tursak. Um, but uh, you'll see, or you have seen uh, these staff before you, and, and we look forward to working with you over the next few years uh, on the plans that we're about to present. Uh, next slide. And that, as you know, a quick refresher, the long range planning section handles all of the comprehensive area master and sector plans, uh, prepare sectional map amendments for your review and the council's approval, uh, minor amendments to the existing plans and to our overlay zones, and also ongoing monitoring and evaluation of our master and sector plans. Uh, with that, I think it's time to turn it over to Sarah Benton, who will walk you through, uh, along with Michael Calamese, uh, an update on where we are with our projects. Sarah? Thank you, Mr. Rowe. Appreciate it, and um, and thank you, thank you for the wonderful introductions. Um, great people to have on board. I know um, Commissioner Gerardo was listening intently on a couple of things in particular, and Ms. Benton. Um, so many of us like food and travel as well. Um, we're limited on one, but we're compensating with the other. <laughs> with the food. Okay, Ms. Benton, you're on. Scott. Thank you, Scott, and thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we wanted to highlight this morning for everyone the active community plans map. As Scott mentioned, um, all of those plans that we do prepare in the long range planning section, if you can go to the next slide, um, we have an active community plans map 
It is available through the GIS data portal. Uh, the website is on the slide there. Um, it's an interactive mapping tool for all those active master and sector plans. You can move around uh, the map and zoom in and out. And when you click on different areas of the map, uh, it pops up with a lot of really useful relevant information, any relevant studies, plans, um, resolutions for that area. Uh, you can click on those and it takes you to the publications page where you can view and download um, the different um, documents that are relevant for those areas. So we do want to highlight that for everyone this morning that IMD helped us create this active community plans map. Um, next slide. So as Scott mentioned, we're going to be doing a, a brief um, overview update on the four projects that we have currently ongoing in the long range planning section. Uh, we have the Bowie Mitchellville and Vicinity Master Plan that was initiated in February of this year. Also, the Adelphi Road UMD UMGC Purple Line Station Area Sector Plan and, and SMA that was just initiated this month. The West Heights Hill Queens Chapel Sector Plan was initiated last month in October, and the Master Plan Recommendation Database and Master Plan Scorecards Project was initiated in 2017, and that's an ongoing long term project as we evaluate um, all of our plans. Next slide. So the Bowie, Mitchellville, and Vicinity Master Plan, that is being led by Thomas Lester, the Project Manager, and Deputy Project Manager, Andrew McCray. Next slide. This master plan area covers four different, um, four planning areas in the county on the eastern side of uh, the county. Next slide. And for a snapshot of the project schedule, we are looking at an anticipated approval date of the master plan of May 2022. Next slide. Um, just to let you know some um, some of the exciting things that have been going on with the Bupa Mitchellville and Vicinity Master Plan. We did hold our first kickoff meeting virtually in June that several of you are aware of. Um, this was the first virtual event um, for the Community Planning Division. Um, all of our events have been virtual given our uh, the limitations of our current situation. We've also been carrying out, uh, we carried out stakeholder interviews, um, held virtual office hours for community members to sign up and chat one on one with community planners. That was from June to October of this year. The existing conditions report has been completed and that was availed, uh, posted online and available for download by the public. We also carried out the, uh, a public open house in September and carried out eight community chats, which were sort of more small group, more intimate settings for the public to uh, join and discuss the different elements of um, the different elements of the master plan as it's being developed. Um, all these uh, overall, the team has held 10 online meetings uh, with the public that had 278 attendees at the kickoff meeting, 80 attendees at the presentation of the existing conditions report and 194 uh, participants across those eight community chats I mentioned. Next slide. Um, just, I believe, about a week ago, we presented the playbook of strategies uh, at a public virtual meeting. Um, these are the recommendations that will be used as inputs um, for the master plan. Um, we also um, have some really talented team members that produce what we call workshops. Um, these are virtual focus area tours um, there, we have two of them on our website through YouTube right now, um, and we've had over 100 views of these uh, virtual tours. So we're excited to share those and hope that you all will visit our website, which we'll um, share with you at the end of the presentation. Next slide. Our next project is the West Heights Hill Queens Chapel Sector Plan. I'm the project manager on this, and my deputy project manager is Kendra Heisen. Next slide. Here we have a map of the project area. It's about 1,081 acres and stretches from the District of Columbia line up to the Prince George's Plaza Regional Transit District. Next slide. Um, sorry about this, we're supposed to have some videos, um, so it looks a little funny on your screen, um, but just some updates on what we've been doing. Um, as I mentioned, this project was initiated by Council in October 2020. Um, and we've been able to uh, carry out some focus groups uh, with community members and some stakeholder interviews. 
We also conducted a rapid strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis in October. Um, we carried out, as Scott mentioned, our, our virtual kickoff meeting in October. These were two separate meetings carried out in parallel at the same time, one in Spanish, one in English. Um, so that was a really uh, exciting um, opportunity to try to reach out to the Hispanic population in this um, project area. Um, we also have another event coming up. It's the public open house that will also be carried out virtually using Microsoft Teams Live and Microsoft um, meetings. That'll be in, on December 5th. Uh, we'll be doing those again in English and Spanish okay. in parallel. Um, okay, um, I, I, need, been, I need to take know, a break. With all these virtual events, I need to take a break just for a second. We're having an issue over here. Sure. Okay, so can we? Okay. I don't hear the beeping. Okay, okay we're gonna mute first. Oh, we are muting. Okay, and the camera too. Yeah, there it is. It's coming from in here. Is your phone on silent? Yeah, my phone's not beeping. Everyone's phone on silent? Yeah, we're Wait a minute. What, you want to wait? And so, how often? How regular was the beeping? I mean, it was right there. Right there. Oh, that's her computer. That's what I was saying. But it all it says that every week. It's picking up on that. It's the it's the. Oh. It's the camera. I know when I hit the camera. How can I get this to stop? Yeah. You just you know to get that? All right, we're good. Okay. We're good. Okay. I'll help you out. Okay. Okay. Um, Miss Benton, we we mission problem solved over here. So you can continue. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think this is a good moment to just mention um, in the long range planning section and in the community planning division, we're using all of the virtual uh, tools in our tool toolbox um, that are at our disposal. Um, we're really pushing on social media. Uh, in different outlets. We're still using email, but also using traditional methods of getting the word out about our project. For example, with this project, we did mail over 8,000 bilingual postcards to um, owners and residents um, of properties in our sector plan area. We hung 50 bilingual posters in the, in the area as well at places where we thought people were still frequenting despite the pandemic. Um, and then also using Facebook, so, uh, Instagram, all of those social media outlets. Um, next slide. Um, a quick snapshot of this project schedule. We are looking at an anticipated um, final approval date for this sector plan in June of 2023. And with that, I am going to pass it off to Michael Calamese, uh, next slide, who will talk about the Adelphi Road Purple Line Station area sector plan. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm going to take a few moments to discuss the Adelphi Road uh, UMGC UMD Purple Line Station Area Sector Plan. Uh, I am the Deputy Project Manager for this plan, and the Project Manager is Shuba Panasi. Uh, you met Shuba during the uh, uh, initiation activities um, for this plan uh, back in October. Uh, the Adelphi Road Sector Plan will supersede and replace uh, within the project boundary the 1989 approved master plan for Langley Park, College Park, Greenbelt, and vicinity. Uh, it will also build upon the recommendations provided for in the Purple Line Transit Oriented Development Study uh, that was conducted by the Commission in 2013. Next slide, please. So what we're looking at now is the uh, map of the sector plan area. The black line is the boundary and everything shaded inside is the area. Uh, you're looking at approximately 103 acres uh, located within planning area 65 and 66. Uh, this boundary uh, includes portions of the city of Hyattsville as well as the city of Palace Park. Uh, the sector plan is generally located south and east of the Adelphi Road uh, UMGC UMD Purple Line Station, which is generally the vicinity of Adelphi Road, University of uh, Boulevard, Maryland 193, uh, and Campus Drive. 
Um, inside of the boundary, you're looking at largely undeveloped or institutional properties and uh, the high preponderance of housing inside of the project boundary is of a multifamily nature. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to go quickly through the project schedule summary. Um, uh, obviously, this uh, this plan was initiated by uh, the planning board and and initiated by county council uh, not too long ago. Actually, uh, we have moved. We have started to move headlong into our public participation activities, um, and I'll say more about that in a little bit. Uh, with our final goal of having the sector plan and sectional map amendment approved. Uh, with the joint public hearing by October 2022. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I mentioned the uh, planning board initiation and the council uh, county council initiation. Uh, we are uh, moving headlong into uh, getting our stakeholder interviews done. Uh, we will be interviewing um, any number of different uh, stakeholders, including public agencies as well. Um, our public kickoff meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, December 9. I believe an announcement was made earlier uh, in the meeting for that. Thank you for that. Uh, 7 to 8.30 p.m. Wednesday, December 9. Uh, in the spring of 2021, we will be uh, carrying out visioning and scenario planning uh, with the community and with an eye for drafting the plan uh, in the summer of 2021. Uh, and with that, uh, on the next slide, I'll pass it back to Scott. Thank you, Michael. The last project that we wanted to talk about is our ongoing master plan recommendation database and master plan scorecards program. Through this, we evaluate the entire county and all 38 of our active mass, master sector and transit district development plans to determine which ones need to be updated on a regular basis, uh, on a uh, as needed basis uh, based on uh, conditions that uh, exist in the community. Um, the master plan recommendation database is a database of all of the goals, policies, strategies, and recommendations in all of our plans, as well as a periodic update of their status. Um, as you might imagine, many of our plans uh, have hundreds and hundreds of recommendations. So gathering this data has is, is been a multi-year process that's underway from uh, once we have those uh, recommendations complete and the status update we're preparing a scorecard for each plan it's really just a snapshot of what um, where we are in implementing a plan next slide please and Arnaldo Ruiz on our staff is the manager of the master plan recommendation database and scorecard project. Uh, recently, we released uh, our first master plan scorecard on the Westphalia sector plan. Um, and what the scorecards will contain are a brief description of the plan and its goals and its major vision and, and goals, um, development activity in the sector or planning area. Uh, what the status uh, is towards implementation if the plan has a uh, a built development build out goal how close are we getting to that goal and also the um, analysis of what are the opportunities remaining to implement the plan and also what are some of the challenges we face in implementing the plan as you know many of the plans that were approved and that are in place were approved prior to the great recession and there were assumptions made back in, in those days about the uh, ease of private development as well as the ease of and, and accessibility of public infrastructure funding that uh, those assumptions are no longer valid and we have to look at things a different way now with with, with current circumstances so um, we are continuing to develop the scorecards for the buoy and vicinity master plan from 2006, the buoy uh, state mark station sector plan 2010. Uh, those are our products that we're developing as part of the new master plan for buoy Mitchellville and vicinity, um, as well as uh, the 1994 planning area 68 master plan and the West Hydesville transit district development plan, which will inform uh, the path forward for our West Hydesville Queens Chapel sector plan. Next slide, please. 
These are a few of the websites that you can go to to learn more about our ongoing projects. Um, each project has its own website uh, with, with information not only about what's going on, uh, but who to contact if you have further questions. Next slide, please. Upcoming events, as was mentioned, uh, we are, will be coming to you on December the 10th to um, provide a more detailed briefing on the Bowie Mitchellville and vicinity master plan. It's going to be on December the 10th. We rescheduled that, I believe, yesterday. Uh, also, uh, in the fall, we will be back to you to initiate a new sector plan for the corridor uh, that includes Garrett A. Morgan Boulevard and Bright Seat Road, uh, including the Morgan Boulevard Metro Station, FedEx Field, and the Landover Mall site. Um, we'll be scoping that through the spring and summer of 2021. Next slide. Uh, with that, uh, this concludes staff's presentation. We're available to answer any questions you may have. Um, so first of all, thank you, Ms. Benton, Mr. Colomese, Mr. Rowe, and, um, and, and everyone, Ms. Um, Reynolds. Um, really, really ap appreciate the presentation, and I'm actually glad that today was such a day. I'm sorry it was so hectic in the earlier, but postponing it to the end, which ended up not being too late, um, enable us to get a fuller presentation. So we appreciate that. Um, otherwise, we really would have been rushing you <laughs> before 11. Um, so we thank you so much. Um, um, very, very thorough, and we're very, very appreciative. I'm going to see if the board members have any comments or questions first. Um, and also to see, it, it, um, from what we've seen thus far, it looks like you have a really good team over there. We're just getting to know some, but it looks like a really, really great team. So thank you. Um, so let's see if there are any questions or comments. Madam Vice Chair. Uh, no, no, no questions, but I agree. Uh, thank you for, for the presentation, and it really does seem like a, a really good team. Uh, I've learned a new word today. Maybe we've used it before, but I've never, I don't recall hearing walk shops. I gotta figure out where I can use that. Love the word. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So, um, um, Commissioner Washington. Hi, no, I don't have any questions, but I too would like to thank the entire team and welcome to Ms. Benton and Mr. Calamese. Uh, very nice job today. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so, uh, Commissioner Dorner. No, I don't have any questions. Um, I, I did want to say that I appreciated how, um, at least for the, the Adelphi Road, the, there's a bunch of information in Spanish on the web pages. I, I think there's also up one with Highfield, but that also includes um, YouTube videos as well. And I, that, that's great because there's a large Hispanic population, particularly in for the Adelphi um, sector plan they're just like south of there and, and even the church the st michael's church that's, that's involved in there has a very large um hispanic mass attendance um so reaching out to that part of the community is definitely good um and, and i'm glad to see that we have all that information up there um and, and michael and sarah welcome to the team um sarah it's, it's unfortunate that you went to uf um i grew up in tallahassee and went to well we'll forgive you for that um because i like all the spanish that, that you've done but thank you both <laughs> okay, uh, Commissioner Geraldo. Hey. Everything's fine. <laughs> You're funny. Okay. That was um, for the benefit of Sarah. Okay. So, um, this, you know, this is a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. And like the, and like the um, police presentation earlier today, I, this is a keeper. So we can we can re, um, refer back to it as needed. So thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, good good job. Glad you were able to explain le more leisurely. Um, and so th thank you very much, team. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I am about to turn to Mr. Hunt, but before I do that, um, well, let me do it right now. As a matter of fact, Mr. Hunt is there. Yes, ma'am. Any additional business to come before this planning board today? There are no additional business items before the board today. Thank you so very much, Mr. Hunt, with gratitude. Um, 
So let me say this. Um, I wish everyone a happy and safe Thanksgiving. It's going to be different. It's a new normal, not or not so new normal anymore, but it'll be a new, different kind of Thanksgiving. But you have many reasons to give thanks. I would invite and encourage everyone to celebrate in whatever way works for you that is safe in this pandemic. You have to improvise, but remember, use that plus column. Think about that plus column. We do have things for which to be very, very, very grateful. Um, I am grateful for all of you and this wonderful team we have here. Um, you know, there's no such thing as a, a perfect human being or perfect entity, but we're pretty darn good. And we've kept this county going in terms of, uh, of the activities and propelling Prince George's County forward safely in this pandemic. And I, for one, am very, very grateful for that. So. Uh, everyone, please enjoy. And also, one more thing to be grateful about, not only is Thanksgiving next week, but we don't have planning board next week. So we have a two-week <laughs> two week break. We have a two-week break. So we will see you all on December 3rd. Take good care. Planning board is adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Happy Thanksgiving.